This is Nathan Buckley's take from round 10, the five biggest issues he took out of it. Right, righto, let's jump off. Now, I've got last night's game well and truly uh, in my mind, but um, the Pies' ruck stocks with Brody Grundy out was never going to be a concern. Darcy Cameron and Mason Cox have the capacity to do it, but it's more about the second tour forward. But Darcy Cameron's game really strong last night. That's not to undermine Brody Grundy's impact on the team, but it's in terms of balance... The challenge for Collingwood is their aerial presence in the front half, and in wet conditions like yesterday, not as not a concern. I have and to Ollie say, Henry stood my up. My ears pricked up straight away. Your opening statement was the loss of Brody Grundy was never going to be a big deal for Collingwood. Was that what you said? Was not going to be as big a deal, not for the ruck role. It's a seven million dollar big deal. No, um, for Brody it is. That's a seven million dollar investment from Collingwood that for someone that you said to it. Without him, it's not a big deal. Um, I think for the balance of the side, it's a big deal. Oh, yeah. I think it's a really strong statement. I just think it's fascinating. And I, you, when Broads comes back, I think the I think Collingwood are improved because their prospects in the front half of the the ground are improved. Um, but I think Darcy Cameron's actually a really good. He played ruckman. a super game, and super will con- game. and will continue to be really strong in that role. Given that he is actually their, their their next best aerial target in the front half, and I think. Craig McRae is trying to keep that ruck roll f- filled so that Darcy Cameron can go forward. But I think his best position is actually in the ruck. Mm-hmm. So um, let's uh, watch and see on that one. Uh, second, I reckon the Blues are the most improved team in the year. And that's not compared to their last year. That's, that's you know, I think that's evident. But since the season has been going, I think they are the most improved team in season. Within the year. So they were three and zero. At the end of round three, mm-hmm. I think since round th- when when they hadn't lost the game, I think their their, their improvement since that point yep. exceeds every other team's improvement yeah. in, in season. Well, they had and, some uh, issues about defence and defending turnover and those sorts of things, which he's yeah you know, clearly gone to work on and continued to develop. Well, and now they're now they've you know they're, they're withstanding Harry Mackay, who's been one of their standout players, who's not in the side. They're, they've they've actually starting to rotate now. Paddy Cripps has missed a couple of games. Williams, McGovern, Martin, Pitnett, all out. And the, and they're they're now playing like a solid unit together in all phases of the game. Now they're going to take on more top eight teams over the next five or six weeks. And the challenge for them is to see how they can execute the the brand that is very established and you know, really is doing the job for them against better opposition. In that sense, and this is number three, Melbourne and Carlton are the best contested ball sides in the competition. Mm-hmm. It's not just about winning ball at, balls at stoppage. It's not just about um, being able to... Um, you know, a Paddy Cripps or a, or a Hewitt or a, even a, an Oliver or a Petrarca. It's not just when the ball's in a contest one-on-one. It's actually, do you put enough pressure on the opposition when you're outnumbered? So I think Melbourne are the best. When they've got two Melbourne players and three or four uh, opposition players, they pressure to prevent the opposition getting away just as much as they win the ball in that situation. Mm-hmm. Carlton are doing that as well as anyone. Um, so, so keep an eye on that because the, the best sides in the competition do that. That's why St Kilda are going well. Uh, that's why Melbourne have been so good over the last couple of years. The fourth one, resting and managing players is an underrated, under-the-surface aspect of teams' performances that we see throughout the, t- the, the season. And Tom Mitchell over the last couple of weeks is evidence of that. I'm going to ask you a question here, guys. So he missed... He missed a, a game, and there was obviously a fair bit of criticism for his his game two weeks ago. Got rested, came back in, and yep. went back into the midfield, yep. and was a significant uh, performer for Hawthorne yep. in their win against Brisbane. Is he is he an, a, a tried and a tried and true? Yeah, you know, rolled gold midfielder, and should you just play him there? It's a it's interesting because Sam Mitchell was on the record of saying, "Hey, we don't necessarily want Tom to or need Tom to be getting thirty five and forty touches." And so then he played him outside the centre square. Then he played him as you know tried to develop his forward instincts and try, and then he got the flu and was crook. So they managed him, and he came back in. They got absolutely pulverised in the middle of the ground in the game that he missed. So he goes back in, has thirty six if not best on ground and the best handful, I reckon there's your answer. And does what a Brownlow medalist does. The other thing that Hawthorne are doing is with their young players. Now, they've played seven of the top eight sides, Hawthorne. Yeah. So they've, and they've performed really admirably, four and six. 
They've, they've rotated their young f- fellows as well. And the sides that do that well, we saw Scott Pendleby after a week out, mm-hmm. came back into the midfield, been tried as a halfback, put him back in the midfield in yeah. those conditions and had a significant So, the, But the, and then you got Melbourne that aren't doing it. I think that I think it happens for players that are that are so far in their career they're probably coming off the back end and they're starting to can you play twenty two intense games of football across the season and obviously with the young blokes I would see the Melbourne players as just in the sweet spot and if you're not if you're not sore or you're not having to be managed just play yeah I think it's a, I think it's pretty it's a pointed. Um, example of a, a difference because the, the Max Gorn situation two weeks ago, going over to West Coast, flying in, you know, knee injury, every single thing pointed to him having a week off. And and Simon Goodwin, he was said, strong, wasn't he? Uh, it's not happening. No, it's, that's not where we're at. Well, whilst we look at the physical aspects of resting, the the, the biggest aspects are the are the, are the mental, and the emotional um, regeneration or yeah. considerations. Simon Goodwin doesn't want his players thinking that they're going to let up at any point. They've got a foot on throat the whole competition, and you're not going to let that go. And for them, it may be, okay, let's get to top four, lock away, and then round 15 onwards, we can look at, you know, maybe give them a spell. And they won't be talking about it if they do do that. All right, and the last one um, this morning, and it's got a Collingwood feel. I I, I unashamedly love this bloke, Jack Crisp, um, whose performances – you know, over years have been that consistent. He's one of the most underrated players in the competition. But once again, yesterday just stood up and, and just keeps going, even though he was apparently crook himself. But uh, a great game yesterday. His 173rd game in a row. Um, steak knives, I've, I've looked them up. Miyabi's are the most uh, expensive <laughs> knives you can get in the uh, in the game. And that's the, that's the version of steak knives he is. And he, like it doesn't matter what the conditions are, he just keeps running. He, he does the basics of the game really well, and he's, I, I don't know. Does he does he fly under the radar? I don't think anymore. I think that's an absolutely reasonable um, comment in years gone by. But I, I think everyone's got an appreciation for what Jack Crisp is able to do week in week out in the game. Arguably, Collingwood's best player. Well, rated from champion as the best player in the comp right now, or the most um, effective player in the competition right yep. now. Um, you can take what you want out of ratings. Right, uh, there's the buck stops, the top five, um, the ruck stocks, which I think is interesting. Um, the Blues most improved this year within season. The Melbourne and Carlton contested possessions. The resting and managing of players, Tom Mitchell, Pendlebury, and then Jack Crisp. Uh, I've got a couple I would like to add. Um, I haven't got a name for mine yet, so clearly uh, our been nothing too, for the old Garrity. Too busy, our people. <laughs> Coaches, tell me about first of all the press conference. Do you go in there with a preconceived idea about what you want to get out of a press conference? Do you try and make a statement when you go in there, or do you just sit back and take whatever question comes your way? Press conference. Uh after a, game, a necessary, a necessary evil for a coach, um, but it is a chance to um, either reinforce or to a, a message or to put something on the agenda, and that's what Luke Beveridge did after the game. Yeah, I've got to be really careful here. Yeah. Because um, he's he's been so dominant, um, and then yeah, there are reasons why he wasn't in the second half. That's all I'll say. He says there's reasons that. Um his influence was not as prevalent in the second mm. half, but then didn't want to give them. Is that a fair and reasonable thing to do, or is that dipping your toe in the water and then just backing out? Well, I think as a coach, you're entitled to give whatever answers you wish. He, he's um, He was clearly speaking about tactics that he didn't feel were officiated as um, stringently as he would have liked. and they'll, they'll... So why doesn't he just say it? Well, he, he sort of did. No, he didn't. You said there's reasons, but he I'm said, not well, going to tell well, you what well, they are. Mm. Are you allowed to be cryptic? I think in the end, like the great Lee Matthews, who we spoke of last week, said that whenever you utter something in the public sphere, you're actually talking, you're still talking to your players. So your players are going to absorb it in some shape or form, whether it's directly through audio, whether they watch it on the TV, whether it comes back through their mums and dads, family and friends. Mm. The, you, you've always the message has got to be consistent. So imagine if you if if you're not presenting authentically in your press conferences, 
Yeah. It creates grey area and, and uh, question marks for your playing group, and that's the only connection that really matters yeah. for a I, coach. I'm not as critical as some have been about that. I'm just wondering, and you're obviously straight out, I'm just wondering whether that was him musing out loud and then pulling himself up or whether he said, I'm going to just put this on the agenda and let everyone else work out what I'm talking about. Who's the best... Um, Who's the best press conference, post-match press conference performer? Or, 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 Chris or Scott. good copy, Chris Scott? Yeah, I think so. Why? Because he's not afraid to say some stuff. Yeah. And then he says it and he goes, I'll probably get whack for that, but I don't really care, you know. So, anyway, he's I don't... He's pretty calm, isn't he? Yeah, he's pretty calm. Um, tell me this. Let's go back to the 3rd of March. 3rd of March this year. Might have been your first appearance with us here at SEN. You had this to say about this young man. One player out of that, John Newcomb, who's seen as a tackling machine. He, yep. just, he just knows where the ball is. And one of the reasons you're a good tackler is because you you actually are right there where the ball yeah. is going to be won. You're not going to get it in your hands all the time. But yep. geez, geez, there, was a, there was passages of play that I thought, wow, this kid... He's, he hasn't played a lot of footy, but I reckon they. I reckon he'll be real interesting to watch. Everyone in the footy he's world beauty, is um, just singing his praises after the weekend, and if um, he's gone into that midfield, so Warple's out. Warple gets yeah. dropped on the weekend. John Newcomb just steps up and says, "I'll be the man." Well, John Newcomb, he's played as he's played as a high forward. He's played as a wingman, and now he's just a legitimate inside mid, and that's exactly where he cut his teeth through the VFL with Box Hill and and with Sam Mitchell coaching. So. It's pretty clear. Sam Mitchell's got a handle on his group, hadn't he? He's he yep. he's got those connections. That's the advantage of having coached his yeah. own team and a lot of these young blokes are coming through. Really smart from Hawthorne to be able to put that in practice to execute it, and all of the, I suppose the um, the angst of of the Clarkson departure, which is inevitable when you when such a, a large figure um, and successful figure over a long period of time, but. Yeah, Newcomb, just one of these group of young Hawthorne yep. players that are coming up under a new coach. John Noble's efforts yesterday could be my favourite moment of the year, that little 20 seconds of play. I know that's a big statement, yeah. but this is when the game was well in hand. He gets a fingernail, chase down tackle fingernail that drags the Freo player off the ball in the same, sort of the same process, then throws himself on a boot and smothers it. Ball goes out, comes, and it's about to come back in 20 seconds later, and he's pushing deep into the fence and throws himself across the the, lead, the leading free player and, and knocks it out of bounds. I um, crikey, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I, I was thinking, I said it in my head, and I wonder is this fair to say? But um, John Noble was the runt twin. Hello. So out 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 of he well, and mean, his brother, let me just uh, he was that. he was the runt twin. So he came <laughs> he, he came is out. Is there a runt twin? Is it? Well, he came out. He came out small. I don't need he, to know. No, but in the end, oh, yeah, but he's, oh, that's a visual we don't need. Now, he had his whole life, his whole life, <laughs> he's had to fight for everything he's got. He had, he, to, fight he to, plays stay like he had to fight to stay alive early. He's had to fight for everything he's got in his life. I love that kid's story, and I love the way he's gone about his AFL career. So he's David Noble's son, yeah. clearly. And but and he's he's done in the shadows. He came as a mature age recruit after – after cutting his teeth at West Adelaide, playing senior football there, came into a mid-season draft. I just love his guts and grit and determination. Uh, and he has he's carved an AFL career out of not much. And I just I, I think there's a, there's a story in that for yeah. everyone. There's so, there's so right. many talented kids around that don't commit enough. And I just love that Nobes is getting some plaudits.